the title of our message for this Easter Sunday is Journey to Joy. We will be looking at Peter's, the Apostle Peter's, personal journey to joy. And I say that the experience I had yesterday leads into this because we will see how Peter struggled, struggled with pride. He struggled with believing that he knew and had all the answers. And his road, this journey that he was on, was a difficult one uh, during uh, his travel, his, his road to this joy. And he, uh, Peter makes it very clear that humility is key. Humility is critical to uh, receiving joy. His road, Peter's road, if you're familiar with the Apostle Peter, uh, Peter was one of the 12 of the apostles. And um, on the road, Peter experienced profound brokenness that came from an intense uh, period of self-realization and suffering that, which led to deep despair. His journey to this joy began with the call from Jesus. The call led to a very high point in Peter's life that we will look at. Just a great pronouncement by Jesus. But that high was followed by a very deep low. A point in Peter's life where he was full of self-loathing and deep despair. But finally... Finally, that road for Peter led to jubilant joy. Peter's transformed life is revealed in his letters written long after Jesus' resurrection and ascension. Some 30 years after Peter died in 67 AD, he was martyred at about 75 years old. And he wrote his letters about between three to five years before his death. And Peter identifies himself as an eyewitness of the sufferings of Christ. And this is what he says. And this is Second Peter. This is where he has now, Jesus has died, resurrected, and ascended. And this is about 33 years after that. And Peter writes, We did not follow cleverly invented stories, when we told you about the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. He said, I was an eyewitness of the majesty of Jesus. And the stories that we've told you and that we've accounted for in Scripture are true. And then Peter goes on to tell of the prophecy that Jesus had given to him as to how he would die. And within three years of writing this letter, Peter would be martyred. In 1 Peter 5, 6, Peter really gives the, uh, he gives a recipe for joy. And this is what he says, Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Humble yourself beneath God's mighty hand. And we'll see why Peter is an expert in humility. And if you know the story of Peter, you know what, we, what he experienced on that road to joy. Well, let's look at it. Let's look at uh, how that road for Peter began. Well, it began with the call. And uh, this was the call by Jesus. And Jesus... Uh, calls Peter. He's, Jesus is in Galilee, and he's walking along uh, the Sea of Galilee. And Scripture tells us that he called Andrew and Peter, who were both brothers. And they immediately left everything to follow him. And Jesus, when he called Peter, he says that, uh, Peter, I will change your name from Simon. And I'm changing your name to Peter. And do you know what Peter means? It means rock. Now, Peter believes that Jesus is the Messiah. And he believes that he's now following 
the son of God. He's following the deliverer who will deliver uh, Israel. And this man, who hardly knows Peter, calls him essentially the rock. Can you imagine what that did to Peter's ego? Can you imagine what it did? I, mean, I think that maybe this is what Peter thought of himself. <laughs> this is what Peter probably thought of himself. Wow. I am the rock? Really? This is Dwayne Johnson, by the way, if you don't know, but he's otherwise known as the rock. And, um, but I'm telling you, any guy would say, hey, I'd like to look like that. But, but imagine Peter, and he has this call, and Jesus changes his name. He becomes one of, of Jesus' top three, along with James and John. Now, James and John, Jesus also renames. He renames them as the sons of thunder. They were brothers. They were, uh, their last name was Zebedee, but Jesus ch changed it and basically said, you are the sons of thunder. So what a team Jesus has. He has the rock and he has the sons of thunder. And, uh, and they made quite an impression. It sounds like a pretty tough group. Uh, these three were special indeed. And Jesus treated, the, treated them as though they were. They were so special that Jesus would often take the three of them and do things that he wouldn't do with the other eight or nine. I, I'm a lawyer, so I'm not very good at math, so please forgive me. <laughs> That's why I became a lawyer. But uh, so he takes, uh, he leaves the other nine, often takes the three. And one of the uh, most remarkable things that he did was he took Peter and the sons of thunder, and he took them to the Mount of uh, Transfiguration. And there Peter was present when he heard the voice of God saying, this is my beloved son, listen to him. He saw Moses and Elijah on that mountain. Peter is thinking pretty highly of himself that I'm one special guy, that I was given this remarkable opportunity. Well, Jesus continued to treat Peter very uh, specially. He took him to when he healed Jairus' daughter and raised her from the dead. Again, he took Peter, James, and John, and they were present to see him raise Jairus' daughter from the dead. So Peter, as he continued his walk with the Lord, he saw himself, I believe, as being very special. But little did Peter know that things were going to change in his life as he continued. You know, one of the uh, neat things about Peter is that he loved Jesus and he loved the fact that um, Jesus was so wonderful and he saw Jesus do such mighty things in the lives of other people. But Peter's high actually before the low came would even get higher. You may recall that in Matthew 16, uh, Jesus asked the apostles, who do you say that I am? And Peter replied, Jesus, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And this is how Jesus responded to Peter. He said, blessed are you, Simon Barjona. Barjona means son of Jonah. That was Peter's uh, essentially last name. So Simon Barjona, you are blessed. For flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter. And on this rock I will build my church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Wow. This is truly amazing. Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of the living God, has called me blessed. He's identified me as being spiritually sensitive and, and discerning the foundation 
of the church? Whatever that means. At the time, I'm sure Peter wasn't sure. What do you mean, your church? But I like it. It sounds good. Um, and, uh, and the gates of hell will not prevail against me. Wow, I'm pretty hot stuff. Hey, Jesus, don't worry about a thing. I got you. And this is probably how Peter saw himself then. I mean, Peter saw himself as powerful. Peter saw himself, this is Jesus, who I just said is the Messiah, the Son of God, and this is what he says about me? Wow. You know, in our journey of faith, all of our journeys, we experience a high when we follow Jesus. We experience his power and his presence initially. I remember when I first came to Christ, and I was, at the time, uh, feeling like I can do anything. So I decided at that time I'm going to run for student body president of Santa Clara University. I'd never been in student politics in my life. But I thought, hey, I can do this with Jesus. <laughs> and uh, it was this high that I had. And, um, and eventually what happened is when they went to put the names of the candidates and their pictures in the paper, well, guess what? They forgot mine. I wasn't even advertised. And, I was, and then all of a sudden there was that low. It's like, oh, my gosh, this is crazy. I'm going to lose. And, uh, but uh, the end of the story is that the Christians came around, prayed for me, and I won. So, but, uh, but this is how we often feel in our, the beginning of our journey with Jesus. We feel this high that we've, we've got Jesus, this relationship, we, we we're well loved and cared for, we, Jesus is never going to leave us, and I believe that that's how Peter felt. He had this uh, feeling about himself that he could do anything with Jesus. But then, in Peter's life, there came the low. And for Peter, this low was very low indeed. And I believe that when Peter wrote this scripture that we've already looked at, humble yourselves therefore under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time, that Peter was remembering these lows and remembering how these lows led to his humbling. In Matthew 16, 23, and this is within a couple of verses of Jesus telling Peter that on this rock I will build my church and saying those wonderful things. Jesus turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. Because what happened was Jesus told everyone that when Peter said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God, that Jesus said, yes, I am. And he told them what the Christ must suffer. And he says to them, this is why I came, that I must be rejected by the elders, that I must suffer, that I must be killed on a cross and be raised from the dead. And the moment there, imagine the disciples, the apostles, the high of, of Peter saying that you're the Christ and what Jesus said in response. And now how did they feel? Wait a minute, Jesus. You're telling us you're going to have to suffer and die? You're going to have to go to the cross? That means a crucifixion? And then Peter said, never will this happen to you, Jesus. So Peter stands up and says, I'm the rock. I'm going to stand up you, Jesus. This isn't happening to you. Just get behind me, Jesus. I'll protect you. And what does Jesus say? Jesus turns to Peter at that moment and said to him, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You don't have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. Whoa. Get behind me, Satan. Jesus, you just told me that the gates of hell will not prevail against me. And now you call me Satan? Remember, Jesus says, you do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. 
When we started our series on Jesus, we looked at his humanity and we looked at the fact that his ministry started in the wilderness. For 40 days, he battled against Satan. For 40 days, Satan was telling him, you don't have to go to the cross. You do not have to suffer and die. I can make you king right now. Just bow down to me. And Jesus battled him for 40 days and ultimately succeeded and, con- and began his ministry. And here, his own apostle is telling him, you do not have to go to the cross. Speaking the very words of Satan. And Jesus says, that's a stumbling block to me. That's a stumbling block that gets in my way, Peter, that, to what God has called me to do. And how many times we, as believers, do we consider our ways over God's ways? Do we think that we know best And God says to us, you are thinking like a man. You're not thinking like I would call you to think. Then he began to call down curses on himself, and he swore to them, I don't know the man. Immediately a rooster crowed. I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's back up. Forget you saw that slide. Okay? Okay. I think God made it clear to me, I want to humble you, Hector, today. (laughs) So I'm learning, Lord. I'm learning. Um, But Peter resisted Jesus' stated plan and took the place of fallen man. He rejected his plan and took the place of fallen man when he rebuked Jesus. Peter rebuked Jesus, think about that. And then Jesus stood up and rebuked Peter. I would not want to have been Peter in that moment. Jesus, Peter was disapproving of Jesus. He was telling him, that is wrong. You're wrong, Jesus. Do you say that sometimes? Do we might in our prayers sometimes say what you're calling me to, the suffering that I'm going through, Jesus? It's not from you. It can't be. It's got to be wrong. As pride, as Peter had talked about, to humble ourselves beneath the mighty hand of God, he's referring to the stumbling block of pride. That pride is indeed a stumbling block for us. I want to show you this. You guys, are you familiar with this? The David? Remember that? This is beautiful Michelangelo who carved this uh, wonderful, tremendous uh, statue out of a block of marble. And what we know is that Michelangelo said when he would see the slab of marble, he could see the sculpture in the stone, in the rock. Jesus told Peter, you are a stumbling block to me. Imagine this being Peter, a rock, but a raw rock, just completely raw, and it's in its original form, and it hasn't been transformed or changed. But when Jesus called Peter, I believe this is what he saw, that he saw in that rock this great work of art that could be done. But in order to get there, something had to happen to this rock. It had to be broken down. This rock required being broken. Jesus prophecies Peter's denial to prove Peter's weakness. Peter, at the Last Supper, was there with all the disciples. Remember, Jesus began to wash their feet. Peter said, you'll never wash my feet. Jesus said, if I don't wash your feet, you have nothing to do with me. And then Peter says, well, then wash all of me, Lord. Not just my feet, but every part of me. And okay, Peter, no, just your feet. You know, you don't, I don't need to wash all of you. 
But Peter ta- Jesus tells them that one of them would betray him. And they ask, who is it? Who is it? Is it I, Lord? Is it I, Lord? And, and afterwards, Jesus tells them all. He says that, that all of you will fall away. That very night, he says, you will all fall away on account of me. But after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. And again, a somber moment as Jesus is looking to what he's about to do. And Peter replies, even if all fall away on account of you, I never will. Jesus, Peter, remember who you said I am. And, And again, you're telling me that I'm wrong? Okay, Peter. He looks at Peter. And he says, at this point, Peter, I I need you to know something. That I know you better than you know yourself. I know you better than you know yourself. And I can't do anything with a rock that looks like that. I can't do anything with that. I've got to break you down. So I'm telling you, Peter, I'm telling you the truth, he says. Jesus says, I tell you the truth. This very night, within just a few hours, before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. Judas had just been identified as the betrayer and had left. The other ten are there in front of them. Peter, who had been called the rock, who had been in this special group with Jesus, is now being identified in front of all of the others as one who would disown Jesus three times that very night? No. No, Peter says. No. Jesus, you are wrong again. Even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And all the disciples, they stood up and said the same thing. Because Jesus had said, you will all fall away. And they took Peter's lead. Peter standing up and saying, no, we're going to say no too. So often as believers and followers of Jesus, it's it's, easier, it's easy sometimes for us to quote Scripture in difficult circumstances and to stand up and to say, I am not afraid that I am going to stand on the Word of God, and we should, and we need to do that. But Jesus knows deep down already how we are feeling. So why not be authentic and honest with Him? Why not fall on your knees, Peter, instead of saying, no, I won't. Why not fall on your knees before your master and say, help me. I don't want that to happen. Instead, Peter stands up and says, it won't. And then, we know the story. They go, Jesus takes them, they go into the garden. And again, Jesus takes the three with him the rock and the sons of thunder, and he says, sit with me, stay, watch with me as I pray. He's agonizing. He's on the ground praying, asking the Lord to take this cup from him, but not my will, but yours be done. And there, there, the three who were to be his closest companions, they all fall asleep. They all sleep through the entire night as Jesus is agonizing, and he's left alone. And, Pete, and Jesus, eventually at the end of the night, gets up and says, okay, let's go. And there is Judas with all of the detachment of soldiers. There he is in the garden. These soldiers, they're there to arrest Jesus. What does Peter do? What does Peter do? I'm going to prove you wrong, Jesus. You said I would deny you. They're all here to arrest you. He takes out his sword and he cuts off the high priest's servant's ear. He stands 
in front of Jesus and says, you will not go to the cross. You will not suffer. You will not die. And G Peter grew up in a Jewish family. He knew the Jewish scriptures. He knew about Gideon. He knew about Gideon, who the Spirit of the Lord came upon him and a small band, and they destroyed the enemy. He knew about Jonathan, Saul's son, who the Spirit came upon him, and he fought against the Philistines and killed them. I can imagine Peter saying, okay, it's my turn. It's my turn now to prove who I am and my love for you, and I'm going to do it my way. And again, he gets rebuked by Jesus. Jesus has to clean up his mess. He has to take the ear with the blood and put it back on the servant's head and heal him. And then he's got to tell Peter, that's enough, Peter. Peter, he says, shall I not drink the cup that my father has given me to drink, Peter? Don't you understand who I am? He tells him, don't you know that if I wanted to, I could ask my father and he would send legions of angels to defend me, Peter? Don't you understand that this is my call and my duty? Put the sword away. And now Peter is humiliated. He's humiliated and he drops the sword and with the other 11, run away. They run completely away. Except John eventually follows Jesus as he's being arrested. And Peter sneaks along with John as well as they uh, want to see what's going to happen to Jesus. And in John chapter 18, John the apostle tells us this. It says, Simon, he says, Simon Peter and another disciple were following Jesus. He's referring to himself. Because this disciple, John, was known to the high priest. So John has a special relationship with the very high priest that is going to end up condemning Jesus. John went with Jesus into the high priest's courtyard. He was allowed in. But Peter had to wait outside at the door. So Peter is again coming to see and maybe trying to, trying to reconcile, trying to uh, fix what he had done and, and hoping maybe to get another chance to prove who he was. But Peter had to wait outside the door. The other disciple, John, it says, who was known to the high priest, came back, spoke to the girl who was there at the door, and, uh, and brought Peter in. So he's like, hey, he's with me. Come on, let's go. Can you imagine Peter? John, John, I'm hiding over here. Well, what are you doing? Telling all of them that I'm with you and, and you just brought me in. Oh my goodness, now what's going to happen? And we know, or we may know, what happened. Jesus had said, remember, that Jesus had said before the end of the night, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Sure enough, servant girl came to Jesus and said, you're his follower, aren't you? And at that time, when there was an insurrectionist, all their followers, if the insurrectionist was executed, their followers were too. Imagine how Peter is feeling. Jesus said he's going to the cross. Jesus said he's going to die. Jesus is being pulled into trial in front of the high priest. Am I going to be executed too with Jesus, maybe crucified with them? I remember Jesus saying something about having to take up my cross too. So Peter denies it and says, no, I'm not one of them. A second time, he's accused based on his accent. He's warming himself at the fire. He's accused because of his accent, and they say, no, no, you are. You're a Galilean. I can tell by the way you speak. And he says, no, no, I'm not. And finally, a third time, they came to him and said, you are a follower of his, aren't you? I know you are. I've seen you before. Matthew tells us, then he began to call down curses on himself. Peter, the rock. Peter, the one who is in the Mount of Transfiguration with Jesus. He is there in the courtyard 
and he's calling down curses upon himself. I don't know the man. When he was calling upon, calling curses upon himself, what he was likely doing was calling God's wrath to strike him dead if he was lying. If I'm lying, let God strike me dead. This is how he was trying to prove to them that he was telling them the truth that he didn't know Jesus. And then immediately the rooster crowed. Luke puts it this way. Peter replied, man, I don't know what you're talking about. Just as he was speaking, the rooster crowed. The Lord turned and looked at Peter. The Lord turned and looked at Peter. Remember what I said, Peter. And Peter remembered the word of the Lord. Before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. At that time, Peter came face to face with his weakest and most despicable self. He wept bitterly over what he had done. His despair and self-loathing caused him to run away again. He had to get away. He had run away from Jesus in fear in the garden and again ran away from Jesus after he denied him. Peter, just like every other apostle except John, abandoned Jesus at the cross. Jesus, we as he was on the cross, said, my, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? His father had to turn from him because he was full of sin. He had taken and had drunk the cup of wrath, taken your sin and mine upon him. So his father at that time had to look away. The only apostle who was there was John. John was there at the cross, but all the others were gone. Imagine Peter, where is he? Where is Peter on this very night that his Savior and Lord and his best friend is dying on a cross? Peter is likely laying somewhere in a pool of his own tears as he can't believe how far he had fallen. Three years of his life, three years of his life professing his love and commitment, and he just threw it all away. I'm sure he remembered at that moment what Jesus had said in Matthew 10. Whoever denies me before men, I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. Jesus, can you ever? No. How can I be forgiven? I just denied him before men. Jesus, Peter likely feared arrest and crucifixion. Who wouldn't? Yet knowing Jesus and his love and grace and mercy and what his, he knew who Jesus was. We will see that this low point in Peter's life did not end there, fortunately. It did not end at that place where he was at his lowest. What about you? What about me? I know that, that I, many times, I have been in a place where I have denied Jesus. Can we be honest with ourselves that what this world is calling and what this world needs, what Jesus is calling us to give to the world is our authentic self is to acknowledge where we are weak, to understand that we have nothing of ourselves to give. It's only Christ in us. It's not us. It's Christ in us, the hope of glory. But in order for his power and presence to work through us, as Peter said, we must be humble and be willing to acknowledge who we are before Jesus and our need for him. Bowing at the feet of Jesus is really the highest place to be. We bow at his feet, and then 
He lifts us up. I love the fact that Scripture tells us that Jesus, when he told Peter that Peter would deny him, Luke says, he said, Jesus said, Simon, Simon. He didn't call him Peter at the time. He said, Simon, Simon. Peter probably wondered, why aren't you using the name Peter? But Jesus says, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you as wheat. Satan has asked to sift you as wheat. What does that tell you about Jesus? Satan is asking for permission from God himself to sift Peter. And Jesus said, but I prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. I've prayed for you, Peter. Do you think God the Father answers Jesus' prayers? Do you think that maybe Peter was at a place like Judas was when he hung himself because he realized what he had done? Do you think maybe Peter was at that low place where he said, should I just do what Judas has done? Especially when he found out because within a few hours of his denial of Jesus, Jesus was crucified, died, and buried. So for all we know, the next time Jesus, Peter hears anything about Jesus, he's told he's dead. He's been crucified. So how is it that Peter gets through this? It's because Jesus had prayed for him. Jesus had prayed for him. Can you imagine Peter coming to that realization? You prayed for me. I remember Jesus. He prayed for me. He prayed for me. Oh, I hope and pray I, I have another chance. I remember what he said, that he would be crucified and buried on the third day, rise again. Oh, but that, that probably can't happen. And you can imagine how Peter was feeling. But Jesus, Peter knew and was learning, finally, is never wrong. Jesus is never wrong. The joy. In John 20, uh, it says, Early in the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and she found that it was empty. She immediately runs back and tells them, the apostles, tells Peter and all of them that they've taken the Lord and I don't know what they've done with him. The tomb is empty. Could it be true? Could it be true that Jesus is alive? Peter and John. I don't know what happened to James, but Peter and John jump up and run to the tomb. And John gets there ahead of Peter. He's faster, apparently. <laughs> and they get to the tomb. And John stops at the tomb. And I'm not going in there. That, that makes me unclean. I can't go into a tomb. And Peter comes barreling through. I got to see this. And he goes into the tomb, and it's empty. Jesus is not there. Why, why would he run to the tomb? Wouldn't he want to be away from Jesus? He knew Jesus. And he was praying and hoping against hope that there would be mercy for him. In John 21, this is now after Jesus has risen and Jesus has appeared to the apostles twice. But both Scripture tells us in both of those appearances, he doesn't say anything necessarily special to Peter. One of the angels tells the women to tell Peter that Jesus wasn't there. So at least Peter knew that, that Jesus was still thinking about him. And so here, three, now there have been two appearances. It's been several days. Jesus has appeared to many. In John 21, it says, afterwards, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. Simon, Peter, Thomas, Nathaniel from Cana and Galilee, and the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. And Peter says, I, I don't know where Jesus is. I, you know, I'm going to go fishing. I'm going to go back to fishing. 
And they all said, okay, we're going with you. So they went out and got into the boat, but they caught nothing. They fished all night and caught nothing. Early in the morning, there was a man that was standing on the shore and um, calls out to them, says, hey, have you caught anything? How many times have you been fishing and somebody asked you that? Have you caught anything? No, okay, I never catch anything when I go fishing. But Peter, there's this man on the beach, and they're out about 100 yards out on the Sea of Galilee, and this man calls out to them, hey, guys, you catch anything? No, we were up all night. We didn't catch anything. And then he calls out. This man calls out to them and says, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. This is the second time that this story is happening. Remember at the outset? that when Jesus first called Peter, he told him to do that, and Peter didn't want to, and Peter did, and a miracle happened, they called this fish. It's like this inside joke. <laughs> Jesus is saying, do it again. What? But for some reason, Jesus doesn't want them to be able to recognize him, so he doesn't look like himself. When it says, he said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you'll find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. And I love John. This is how he writes. This is in his gospel. He writes, then the disciple whom Jesus loved, he's referring to himself. <laughs> John, Jesus loves me the most, but he says, then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, Peter, it's the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, it is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him, for he had taken it off, and he jumped into the water. He leaves them behind with all the fish, and he's just going to the beach. He has to be with Jesus. This is a beautiful story of redemption. This is a beautiful story for all of us because we will fail. We will fail. Maybe not as bad as Peter, but we will fail. And when we do, let's not forget Jesus is calling us, him, us to himself. Let's be like Peter and be quick to go to him. So Peter is running to the shore. It says, he shows up, and when he does, there's a fire burning with coals on it, and there's some fish. So Jesus has already cook, started cooking breakfast. And then Jesus says to them, bring some of the fish you have just caught. Simon Peter climbed aboard. He had to go back to the boat, and he's looking at this man. I, I know that's you, Jesus, right? But he goes back to the boat. He helps him drag the fish. And uh, John writes, it was full of large fish, 153. 153. Exactly. Not 152, not 154, but 153. I bet Nathaniel is probably there counting them. One, two, three, four. Wow, guys, this is a lot. Five, six, seven. And maybe Jesus said, no, you don't have to count them. There's 153. Just get over here. Let's have breakfast. <laughs> but you can imagine Jesus there with Peter. And there Peter's just looking at him. It says, when they had finished eating... Jesus said to Simon Peter, they're just sitting there with Jesus with a fire on the beach. Doesn't that sound great? They're sitting there. They're full. He looks at him and says, Simon, son of John. He doesn't call him Peter. Simon, son of John, do you truly love me more than these? Do you love me more than these other the disciples, do you love me more than fishing? Do you love me more than anything? And Peter says, yes, Lord. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me? Peter answered, I'm sure a little discouraged, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, 
take care of my sheep. Really, Lord? You want me to care for your sheep? I who have denied you and rejected you, who wasn't there for you? But then a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? John writes, Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? And Peter says, Lord, you know all things. Do you think Peter finally recognized that Jesus knew everything and it didn't do any good to hide from him or to keep anything from him? You've proven to me, Jesus, you know everything. You know every thought and intention of my heart. You know everything about me. You know my weaknesses. You know everything about me. You know that I love you. And Jesus said again, feed my sheep. <laughs> and now, Peter's there with all the, those other apostles, and Jesus tells him this. He says, I tell you the truth. When you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. Peter, you younger, earlier in the days, you did whatever you wanted. You were free to live and do as you wanted to do. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. What did Jesus mean by that? John tells us, that Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then Jesus says to Peter, follow me. Follow me. That's how it all started with the call. It all started with Jesus calling Peter, Peter to follow him. But the man that he called from the beginning was not the same man at the end. The man that he now needed to follow him, the man that he was calling to follow him, was now this man. He had changed. That rock had been broken down. Broken down, and now Jesus was saying, now I can use you. Now I can use you, Peter. That's his call for all of us. Apart from me, Jesus says, we, you can do nothing. He's calling us to acknowledge our weaknesses before him, and to trust him, to give us what we need and to make us into the, that disciple of his that he knows you can be. You can't do it on your own. You can't. But he is there for you. Let's pray. And I'm going to ask you, if, if you feel like you want to respond to this message and you feel you would like to receive prayer in any way, in the back we have a prayer corner. During these songs, we'll have two songs in which we are just worshiping the Lord and responding to this call. Feel free to go to the back in that corner and there will be pastors and elders ready to pray for you if you'd like to. And then we have prayer also after the service. Please take advantage of that prayer. And if by some chance you're here and you don't know Jesus yet, you don't know him in that way, you can't trust that he is even alive because it sounds so incredible. What do you mean he's alive? He is alive. And that's why we celebrate Easter. We're celebrating the risen Savior, Jesus. He is alive. And he's calling you to trust him. And you may have all these doubts just like Peter did. You doubt his word. Just ask him. Just ask him on your own when you're by yourself. Just ask him if it's true and you have called me to yourself. Would you please reveal yourself to me because I'm too dense and I need help and I want everything you have for me? Please reveal yourself to me. And you may be at a place where you say, I, but I don't want that. You do want joy. I know you do. We all do. 
and the joy that Jesus offers can only be found in him. And he's calling you, all of us, to go to him and to come to him. And you can do that today. You can say, yes, I believe, Jesus. Help my unbelief. I repent of my sins, and I trust in you today. If you've done that for the first time today, please go back and let somebody know in the corner. We'll pray with you, and we'll pray for you. We'll walk this road with you, this journey to joy. Lord Jesus, thank you for who you are. Thank you that we don't have to hide anymore. You already know everything about us. And it's only when we come to the end of ourself, Lord, that you can then work. Help us not to be afraid of the end, but to embrace you, to embrace you, to go low that you might lift us high. Help us to remember Peter's words, to humble ourselves beneath your mighty hand that you would lift us up. And we would cast all our cares upon you because you care for us. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.